It wasn't like that they had to stay there either. So I, I hope I entertained them with my conversation and I hope I'll entertain you today. And good fitness too. Uh, DJs, to watch. DJs. Band, yeah, plenty of band to watch. Band yeah. at, um, same sort of thing at uh, Star Casino on a Thursday night. Rock and Ben did a live band there. Plenty of dancers there too. Uh, I think we're right. Coffee drinks are all fixed. Mobile phones off. Thank you. Okay. I've got no vision there, Michael. Uh -huh. So, uh, welcome today. My name's Jack Randall, and um, uh, I paint. And I paint, as you can see, in a, an array of styles. I'm an impatient painter, and uh, I'll do some things for a little while and then move on very rapidly. But... Um, uh, I, I thank you all for coming today, and, I, and I'd like to welcome uh, some friends from Hobart and Alice Springs and Barcelona and my hometown of Dubbo. Um, I'm going to talk to you about the secrets of the Fauves colour palette. Now, the Fauves were a, a very brief modern art period uh, from 1904 to 1909, and uh, they included um, uh, Henri uh, who persisted with a high-key colour palette after that very sh brief period. Uh, the other members, uh, Vlaminck and Durain, etc., moved on to other things and they used another palette after, subsequently. Um, uh, Georges Braque had a brief interlude uh, with, uh, with the Fauves. So... Uh, this, the secrets, they, they, they didn't get particularly theoretical, unlike um, uh, some later people like Paul Clay. And um, so what, I, what, I, what I'd like to uh, discuss with you and, and perhaps demonstrate a little is uh, th those secrets. And um, I'll cover these topics. Uh, the use of colour in rendering emotion, uh, how our imagination enriches observation, the perception of nature in its essential forms. Now, there, there are three key things about making pictures in a fauve manner or in a high-key colour palette. Uh, some of the other things that uh, we need to consider from a technical point of view in regard to that are the careful choice of subject matter. If we intend to give free reign to our, to our colour palette, then it's uh, very prudent to choose the subject matter carefully uh, and once the, the subject matter is chosen, we need to draw and design for painters, uh, which is, uh, and I'll show you, this is somewhat different than drawing uh, for other reasons. Uh, I'll discuss a little of the nuances of the, uh, the Fauve palette and uh, techniques. I'll demonstrate some techniques for a free and open style, which is consistent with the intuitive way that they uh, made pictures. Uh, you'll also um, uh, be invited to visit my website um, and um, there's some more information about what I do and uh, the workshops that are available uh, in this area. So uh, at the beginning, you'll see that uh, I have, I have the, uh, the colours laid out in a warm, cool um, variation. So we have greens from cool to warm. Uh, they're my greys. They're what I call my warm greys. 
Um, but an orange from cool to warm, uh, the yellows from cool to warm, black and white, of course, uh, including a Payne's grey. And my reds are in cool to warm. V v the purples, same, and the blues, cool to warm. And uh, when I arrange a, a palette, those are the considerations that I make. Um, obviously, light and dark and clusters of colours. So I might, I might put all my greens together. But the consideration that I need to make uh, is warm to cool. So on this sample palette, uh, I have a cool, warm, cool, warm, cool, warm, cool, warm, cool, warm in the variations. Now those, those choices or those determinations are, are a little subjective. Uh, you might consider that um, uh, my blues, for instance, that may look warm to you. Um, but it, it, colour is a, is a subjective thing. Um, I just want to begin painting so that I f don't forget to do so. And uh, the, the consideration that I'm, what I'm, I'll just explain to you what I'm going to do. I'm going to do a, a cool to warm sky um, to begin with. And I've, I have here my cool, my warm blues, my cool with some white. And I'll lay that in initially as the first thing that I do. Um, I'll go on the right, my warms. The, the, um, the areas that are marked out in chalk are uh, for foliage. My colour sketch was small for this one. And uh, I would ordinarily do this part of the process uh, on plein air. I would ordinarily do it outside. So there's my image. It's a church. Uh, can they come and see that? It, yeah, it's a church in the, uh, in the countryside. Um, I think it's deconsecrated because it doesn't have the crosses on it. Um, but uh, churches are in fairly unique landscapes because they're, they're relatively untouched um, because they've obviously been there for a long time. They're locked up in their own little boxes of, of ground. So the grasses and everything are fairly unique. And there's the colour sketch that I made at the time. And so uh, I don't have that advantage at this point to be as exuberant as I might, but I have a principle involved here. I want the warm blue to be on the right-hand side. So at this point here, I'm starting to shift to the cool side of the, um, of the colour values. going to have to uh, get paint on that easel. So I start to pick up a little bit of blue on the cool side. Now, can you name the colours for this? Yeah, okay. Taylor blue is my cool blue. And you can see, i uh, just grade that off. And cerulean and cobalt are my warms. So you can see that I have established those those values of warm to cool. And that's consistent with what the best of the foes had done. Um, they created a colour vortex within the work. And I'm not even sure, because there's not that much documentation, but I'm not even sure that they were uh, altogether aware of, of, that, uh, of doing that. Uh, Matisse wasn't known as a theorist. He was more of a doer. And uh, I want some more white back there. Do I always sketch first? I always do. Um, uh, I'll get on to sketching in a moment. The sketching for for painters is um, is different than sketching for sketching. Uh, you'll see that's that's a sketch. For painting, for painting, it's uh, it's very coarse. Um, so there's there's that that part, and it's and it's a knock-in stage. It's uh, when I when I describe it in workshops, it's it's called a knock-in stage, and we have three stages. Uh, there's a knock-in stage, then there's an adjustment stage. Uh, it's usually when the paint's dried, and I, I've had a 
uh, some time to consider the composition. And then finally, there's a the detail. And um, most every painting uh, will work through those three stages, and they can be some time apart. Um, uh, I'm going to now scumble some colour into the foreground. Now this will be this will be an underpainting uh, section, and I want to keep the same value sweep left to right. So it's kind of glazing with acrylics, if you like. And I want to warm it up on the right-hand side. And I'll rework that area later on. And the reason I use a free and open brush style, style is to add energy to the work. Um, so, so that it, it has, has its own contained energy. That's going to have to go. Uh, and I and I get that I draw that from when I'm painting en plein air I draw that from the from the, I, I try to respond emotionally to uh, what's what's available and generate energy that way. The um, uh, as a colorist I know that color is a tricky tool. Um, uh, you may know that if you if you place a color anywhere on a on a picture if you if you're a painter, that uh, it'll affect the whole composition. And uh, what I find is that when I put a colour down uh, and I turn away and look around and, and um, do something else, uh, it'll have its own conversation. So the colours that I've just put there will start talking to each other uh, almost independently of what I had intended to do. And um, uh, what I find is that in that, in that dialogue, then I have to have another conversation. So I'm not only am I having a conversation with the, uh, with the subject, but I'm also having a conversation with the colours in particular that I've used. That's assuming that my design and my drawing is, is going to stay pretty much put throughout the, 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 uh, the work. And um, one of the things that I enjoy about painting on plein air is that uh, there's a whole bunch of other conversations, including birds and butterflies and wind and, and uh, light changing uh, through, through time. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the only way to respond to that is not to try and control it, but to, uh, to take some risks and see what happens. Um, uh, I had the great privilege to speak to Arthur Boyd before he died, and um, uh, I, I asked him, you know, he must have painted every brush stroke and every colour that was imaginable in a long working life as a painter. And uh, my question to him was, did he ever make mistakes? Did he ever get caught up? Did he ever, did he ever get, um, get bogged down? Was he ever unexcited about it? And uh, his response was, yeah, yeah, I still do make mistakes. And that's, that's the exciting thing. And so it, it's a risk taking process. And that's what I would encourage you to do. Um, when we use when we use colour, uh, we make judgments about. I've already given you some judgments, some cool, warm values. Uh, obviously, we look at uh, light and dark, and uh, then you have um, its tonal value, its physical uh, qualities. Um, but uh, I want, I'm going to put a challenge to you uh, to uh, ascribe um, emotional values to the colours that you use. We all end up with roughly the same palette after a while. We, we, we veer towards certain colours. And uh, what I want you to do is to uh, think about not only its tonal value, um, its pigment quality, but also its emotional value. What characteristic, what personality would that colour have? And uh, you will find that you can respond more, uh, more intuitively, more emotionally, in the, in the painting that you do. Um, if we take, uh, well, there's raw umber, but if we take burnt umber, for instance, its, uh, physic its physical property is that it's a fugitive colour. So it, I, I don't know if you've ever noticed, but if you get a tiny speck of burnt umber in uh, any other colour, it will contaminate it. It's fugitive in that sense. It won't stay put, you know. It's, it's unlike a little bit of... Uh, 
lemon yellow, which will wash out in almost any other colour and become invisible. But um, burnt umber is, a, is quite a fugitive colour. But then it's dull and it's dark. And uh, so uh, I wonder what, um, what quality you would uh, ascribe to such a colour, such a rogue, um, such a robust colour, you know. And that's, that's the challenge that I, that I would put to you. And if you can't find an emotional match for a colour, let's say you never liked pink in your life, um, if you can't find a, an emotional match, uh, go outside and, and um, let the environment tell you. Uh, we all, as painters, as artists, have an, an abundance of imagination. But if it's failing you, go outside and see what the world says to you and uh, you'll, you'll end up with um, some of those values working for you. I'm going to do some more here. Uh, I'm going to put the walls of my church in. I think that's the next thing I do. And um, I'm going to commence to use a card, which is another technique that I hope you'll be able to use at some point. So I'm going to put my um, colour values in here. Now the what the card does is actually stops the colour from drifting off all over the place. And I only want it thin. I don't want it too, too tight. I want it very thin. So I'll put some on, take some off. And I'll tidy that up a little bit later. Okay. Uh, my very neat scheme here is going to fall into disarray soon, so um, uh, don't, don't expect it'll stay that way. Um, then, uh, what am I up to? Okay, I'm working from a formula. So, can I get some of that colour? I am, because that will demonstrate to you a, col a colour vortex so that um, uh, and the, the best of the foes work um, shifts through a, a range and it sweeps forward based on a vertical vertical axis. Uh, there's a couple of examples that I can, that I can give you on that score uh, and you can look them up and somebody found them and uh, some examples in my, um, in my sketchbook in a moment ago. The, um, the, the church in days gone by used to employ some fantastic architects. You know, they were very cons well considered buildings. And they, uh, they create good forms in a natural environment. And the, the card thing that I'm using actually stops the colour from, from going all over the place. I mean, the, the loose brush stroke is, is, uh, is neat, but uh, it's not everything. I think I've forgotten something right here. And then I need to do some lemon yellow. Uh, red oxide. And I'm going to do my eaves. Now I'm, I'm overstating the colours because uh, my uh, the, uh, my theory for making pictures is um, if you're going to take the cap off a uh, off a particular colour, it might as well be a bright one to start with. It's pretty hard to make a colour bright uh, if it's overpainted. Uh, on a dark area. So that's what I need to do on that section. That's that. So I can always dark, I can always knock it back, but I, it's pretty hard to lift it up afterwards. And um, you may wonder why my palettes are white and not wood or any other colour. And uh, that is because if I'm painting on a white board, you need to have a white palette. So if you've gone and got a, a blue um, ice cream bucket lid, 
then your colours are going to change, particularly those uh, transparent colours. Uh, they're going to change on your palette by the time you go to there. You, don't, you really don't know what uh, value they're going to have. Um, okay, it's proper walls. I think I've forgotten that bit. These are my favourite things in the world. Um, sea sponges. Um, and I need to make uh, some, some shadows in, uh, in the arrangement. So I'll do that in warm and blue. But I'll use that. Needs to be a bit wet. So I'm working up the darks at the moment. The, uh, the shadows of the foliage is what I'm working on. And the same, pr same principles apply. In that I have a nice vertical there. I have a nice vertical portion of my structure that I can flip the warm cool values over on. Um, I'm going to turn the other side up. There's not enough, so I'm going to get some cobalt. So around that central point, I want to flip from cool to warm. And that'll create a <coughs> colour vortex. Remember to start with your sponges. If you're using sea sponges, start with them wet and, um, uh, because the, the pigment will go right into the, into the fibre um, and they'll wash out a lot easier if they're already wet to begin with. Uh, we have some uh, colour areas on the sky, some shadow of the, uh, on the um, church roof. Uh, but I'll need to put that in a little bit later. Um, there are some shadow areas across the bottom that I need to put in there. I'm using raw umber. And these are shadow areas. Cast from the tree down as much as I need to do on that score. Uh, there are some essential forms in nature. Line, tone and texture are generally accepted as universal. That's line, tone and texture. Now I didn't use colour. Uh, Colour is too subjective. It's species subjective and it's culturally subjective. But the essential forms are line, tone and texture. So if I, if I say, um, uh, what does a dog do when he sits on sandpaper? He goes rough, rough. So texture is trans-species. Uh, it's, it's relatively universal. And um, uh, dark and light or tone is also accepted, you know, it's also universal. Um, uh, Mr. Mr. Caveman, for instance, um, uh, would, you know, uh, he would be afraid of the dark because the thing that was going to eat him was probably in the dark and he, he's, uh, his pos potential escape was probably in the light. So, I mean, it's, it's critical to understand some values about texture and in tone, uh, and it's also uh, critical to understand uh, some values about line as well. So a bird uh, will quite readily land on the, the line of a, of, a, um, of a fence, or a piece of wire or a branch, and they'll recognise that even moving, um, but they'll, they'll stumble with a pane of glass. I mean, we've all seen a bird fly into a 
a flat surface, but it can recognise lines very easily, and so do we. So they're the three key things uh, about making pictures. And um, uh, the, uh, the subjective exercise of, uh, of, of emotional name-dropping that, uh, that I've asked you to do, to put a, an emotional value there, is, a, is about the spectrum of emotions. Our colour has a vast spectrum. Look, we're surrounded by uh, a, a huge array of colour choices. And uh, I always start with pretty much what comes straight out of the tube because it's such a... Derivan produces such a, a, a massive array of original and unique pigments that that's all I need to start with. And then I fine-tune it in the subsequent stages. Um, uh, so, um, really... What I need to do is start with warm to cool, and that gives me enough structure, and then I can throw the emotional stuff around that later on. Uh, I'm going to do some some shadow in my church. I'm going to do these undersides now. And the card comes in pretty handy now because I don't want my, my yellow messed up too much there. And uh, one, of the, one of the huge advantages of why I like to demonstrate this particular technique, and I don't use it all the time, um, is that it keeps the colours distinct, which is what I like. I like those, that sharpness that, uh, that comes with the separation. Uh, it allows me to work quickly and um, So I'm pulling some white out of this particular colour, which is dioxazine purple. Is it? Yeah, I, hope, I hope that's said right. I'm not very good with uh, colour names. I just use them. It's a very deep, warm pigment. And I'm going to shift it across to the, the cool value of this light purple with some white. This one is called Permanent Light Violet for this section here. And it needs to be a little darker. So I add some Taylor Blue. So I needed to do that bit next. Um, and then I need to do my roof. I'm running out of palette area here. I'll start with my roof in white and, and you'll you'll see the value of uh, the card edge in this circumstance. I'm able to run right up to the um, to the foliage and get a nice crisp line and once again keep the colour areas away from uh, that lively lemon yellow push up 
here. And of course, I get a little bit of overshot too uh, from the, car the mark of the card. And I'm, I'm pretty happy with that happening. I'll just take that out of there. And I'm going to bring some other values in here, which is Australian Ghost White. No, I'm not, because I can pick up some of that maple yellow just there. And because it's um, it's uh, a corrugated iron roof, I get to do this thing here. I just need to check what that part of that... That's another bit of roof out there. I've already contaminated that brush, so I've got another one. And we can make some make some rusty lines down the roof. They really need to be they really need to be parallel. And on that front roof, we need to go on some purple up there. enough for now. So my colours start to have their own conversations. Once, um, once the red's talking to the yellow in the foreground um, and uh, the dynamic is... The, the, the work p picks up its own momentum. Um, uh, we need to address that if it's uh, at odds with what we had intended to do. Uh, we, we have to recall um, the... Uh, the physical values of the of the paint to make sure that it's doing the thing that, that there's darks in the in the right place that there's particular lines in other places, um, but also that the emotional characteristic is consistent with uh, with what our probably our first impression uh, was when we went and found the the subject for our work. Um, it it really is true that you you don't get a second chance at a first impression, so uh, we we go with that. And uh, if, you, if you plan to take up the challenge uh, laid out by the, the Fauves and their intuitive use of colour, um, and uh, if you feel that your intuition is uh, a match uh, for your imagination, uh, then there's a couple of suggestions that I can make here. Um, I can do this in more detail and more time if you uh, want to join me in one of my workshops. Um, uh, but... Uh, whether the subject is in the studio or uh, whether it's a still life or a nude or, or even a photographic image. I mean, I, one of the reasons I uh, precipitated, uh, designed the uh, en plein air workshops is because so many of my painter friends, and, and I myself included, work from photographs. Um, and uh, that's not a problem uh, until they, th th that whole notion becomes flat. Um, and we need to go outside. But uh, your, your careful choice of subject matter uh, is, is really important to, to give uh, your intuition and your imagination free reign. Um, it's, uh, uh, I, I don't know what, um, let me think, if we were to paint a pub in, uh, with little 
detailed lace work on the on the old wrought iron and um, um, you know in in an old schooly type of fashion, then it's not going to lend itself to too much exuberance. So uh, one of the reasons I've chosen this building is because it's very plain, uh, but the shadows cast some really nice angles. So you, a, a choice of subject matter is uh, is great of great importance. And if you don't use one, then um, uh, one of the things I suggest is a viewfinder. So uh, it's, it's a bit like a, a camera without, without a lens. Um, hold it up, frame the, the subject and crop, take out, remember to take out. What we leave out is uh, critical to the design of a composition. Um, uh, I also use uh, software um, uh, on my computer. And uh, in the event that, uh, such as this, that I'm going to paint this subject uh, in the studio, then I uh, use uh, a program called Photoshop and I oversaturate the colours. I simplify the, uh, the composition and I use the computer as a drawing tool um, so that I can uh, get to the point very quickly. Um, drawing and design for painters uh, is, is nominally different, as I said, from uh, drawing for... Uh, for sketchbook type work. Um, uh, drawing for painting requires good design uh, because the ability to change the design, once the paint has begun to be applied, the, your ability to change the fundamental design of a, of a composition is limited after you've begun to paint. Um, so drawing for painting is a, is a bit like, well it, it is, it's specifically about mapping colour areas. And uh, if we map the colour areas, it's sometimes just like a mud map. Um, here's a, a partially produced work and what I like to do is, is use a cool and a warm value in the mud map so that I can simply reference from the, the colour of the chalk uh, whether it's a cool or warm value. Um, and uh, that's a relatively detailed mud map. It's probably more detailed, certainly more detailed than I would start uh, a composition like this, particularly on plein air. So uh, colour mapping as opposed to detail making uh, is important. If there are details or, or colour references, write that in the, in the side of the, uh, the sketchbook uh, or write it on the back or write it on the painting if, uh, if you're painting on plein air. Now the fauves uh, were... I'll just, just reference them again because... Um, it's important to put them in context. Um, the Fauves responded to the advance of photography and um, uh, the only edge that the painters had after <laughs> photography became uh, widespread in, in popular culture uh, was, was high key colours. The intuitive use of colour, which is uh, what I'm suggesting that we do uh, today, is, uh, was the only edge that they had over uh, photography as a representational tool. When the first Europeans explored Australia, uh, they referenced the things that they saw with watercolour and little sketchbooks. Uh, but by the time Scott went to the Antarctic, uh, photography was the main way that they referenced what they saw. And uh, the Fauves were addressing that. They said, well, OK, well, if we're no longer required to, uh, to tell you how things look, we'll, we'll tell you how they feel. And uh, that, give, that gives painters a, a huge advantage and that, that advantage um, remains today. There's, uh, what, what we do, the, the tactile presence of paint um, is not available in any, um, any painting process. I've often seen photographs that look like paintings but I, but I feel uh, disappointed on closer inspection when I discover that they've been done by some digital trickery. Um, and that, uh, you know, I... I'd, uh, with a good painting, I never get that because it's a tactile thing. I know that there's a representation of the handmade mark already there. Um, so I'm up to my tree trunk, I think. Let me check my menu. Yep. I'm going to do some orange highlights. Ah, that'll be good, yeah. I could nearly start to use that one again, but I'll leave that one. Thanks. I'll go back to my sponges. 
And now that that white's dry a little, I can, I can put, there's uh, some shadow. It's not wet enough. Okay, that's that. And then some orange. Do this as well. When I get to do my tree at this point, I need to do the eaves though, I think. Another brush. Green. After I go to Payne's graphic. I'm, going to, I'm using a lighter tone on the offside. I've predetermined, well, I already know that the light source is from this side, so the light source down there. And uh, a little bit of underglow there. And what I'm going to do is roll a shadow around that area to help give some form to the tree. And I love it the way that um, the gum trees roll their shadows. I'm going to 
drag some of that off too. Okay. Uh, I'm going to need to start to work, start to think very quickly now about the foliage. So I've got a, I've got some warm and cool greens. Start on the cool side. I'm going to start to lay my colours in now. Gum trees are conventionally a little blue. So I'm going to be robust about these, this colour application. to the warm side of the uh, of the composition I'm gonna this is a delightful tint Talo green um, the painter Gary shade uses it quickly and uh, another warm green is Australian olive green pick up some warm yellows So this is called scumbling, if you didn't know. And uh, I'm going to be fairly robust with it. OK. I'm not real happy with that shadow. I'll find another way to render that. And um, I will move pretty soon down to the foreground. So the same principles are applying in the foreground. I want to move from cool to warm across. <coughs> so from cool on the left-hand side. And I'm going to polish the scumbling technique this time. Allow some of the yellow to come through. And I'll pick up that area with the brush in a moment. So the key to the overall uh, principles of the foves are, are cool and warm, um, but there's also some uh, emotional values in there too. Uh, the um, the yellows and the purples are, are going to they're going to bounce around a fair bit, and they're going to make for a, a much more interesting composition than I might have had I uh, been too tonally consistent. Uh, I'm nearing to the end of this demonstration now. This is about as far as I, I would essentially go in the first stage with a composition like this. I will uh, pick that up at another time and I'll uh, shape it up a little bit, add, uh, add some tonal adjustments. And then I'll leave it again, uh, probably for some time, before I add any detail. But um, I love, if you haven't got one of those, I, I love this particular brush because it makes this... Uh, this particular mark and um, I'll, I'll load up two colours it'll make this particular you know it's a very useful uh, brush tool so 
and it'll, it'll make um, really useful mark. I'll love it. I mean, it's a bit of a cliche with the, uh, with, the with the grass is rendered in this fashion, but um, it uh, it it does a, a wonderful job for in a very very brief amount of time. And that breaks that line between the church as the as the the uh, the grass creeps up there. What I'm going to do at this point too is use the edge of the card to bring in some useful uh, marks right up in the foreground to advance the composition to bring it to to make it really come forward. So, uh, at a knock-in point, that's sufficient. There's some, there's some more colour, more rendering, some more detail from the church um, to come through there. Um, I'm still not happy with the trunk of the tree. I think it needs to probably be a little bit darker, but I'm going to pick that up a little bit later on, I think. Um, but uh, there's one, one further thing that I want to show you. This, at the second stage of painting, the... Uh, the Derivan paint lids are really useful. And um, if I have to match a colour, I can just match it in there like that. I sort of make up my colours. So I think that is that colour and that colour together. And if I want to match it, I can just hold it up there. So I'll make my colour match there. Uh, over the top of the painting, rather than here on the palette, try it here, here. So uh, save those. When you buy them, um, save them, because they're really useful for that purpose. So what I've shown you today um, is uh, a couple of techniques, um, hopefully to encourage you to work in a free and open style. Um, you've seen uh, that technique, the, um, the, the clear lid, uh, colour matching technique, you've seen me use a, a, a rag as a scumbling tool and you've seen, uh, seen me use um, my card edge as a, as a colour separation tool. Um, it, it keeps the areas separate and I'm not having to fuss too much with, uh, you know, paint up to an edge. I mean, I can. I mean, I've used a, a brush long enough that I can make a, a very rapid, sharp stroke. But I, I love the mechanical process of a, of, a, uh, of a sharp edge and to, to break away form um, I, uh, we can uh, there, there's a demonstration that I use in my, uh, in my workshops where I can actually make the form of a vase so I can make it uh, using this technique three dimensional in a fashion that the cubist used uh, they broke up the form into small prisms of light and um, uh, that technique is is excellent for that. And the, the reason that it's excellent is that it, it obliges you to work rapidly and it keeps the brush strokes, the colour brush strokes separate. Uh, the, 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 the only place you can go wrong with that is to rework it too soon. And uh, So you've, you've seen those uh, three techniques and um, if you join me on my workshops and you can find the workshops, uh, the registration form there, uh, you'll learn some other techniques such as contour graining, uh, Sgraffito and um, uh, more in-depth and timely uh, demonstrations of the techniques that you've seen here today. So uh, I thank you all for being here and I'm ready to take your, qu your questions uh, about colour and perhaps the fauves. So do we have... Yeah. Have you seen performance of rather long orchids when you don't need much fauve? That's right. And uh, people have often mistaken my, my work to be to have been done with oil, um, but the uh, Derivan Matisse uh, structure colours sit up really well. Um, the, the pigments are strong. Uh, the um, the wet to dry values are, are very close. Um, so and um, you know I can do that without gloving up. You know, uh, it's fantastic. Um, yeah. 
So, yeah, I, 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 I like to paint with oils, but um, I just prefer not to, um, mainly around the toxicity issues um, uh, of, of turps and oil, but um, uh, acrylic is, is the deal. This is, this is wonderful stuff. Is it wonderful? Uh, absolutely. Um, my wife found a painting of mine at somebody's 40th birthday, and I'm not going to tell you how many years ago that was, but um, I'd done the painting in 1977, and uh, in these colours, um, uh, and it was still good. And um, uh, so we bought it back because she loved it. Yes. Well, it's not necessary. My, um, uh, my understanding, uh, my technical research says that it's not necessary. However, uh, in some works where the, where the colours have been flattened out, um, uh, I do. Um, so I, I use it for its visual... I use a, a glaze for its visual effect rather than its protective values. And uh, Derivan make uh, an excellent um, acrylic glaze and... Um, uh, that one, that one, uh, six or seven coats. This one here, probably six or seven. So, yeah, and uh, they lay out beautifully, and they harden up. They're a little bit soft to begin with, but after a couple of weeks, they dry up really quite, uh, quite solid. Yes. Oh, I, oh, to see how close it is. Okay. <laughs> okay. Oh, well, uh, I mean, this is just a colour sketch. This is a... Yeah, uh, it's had another two, uh, two colours, but the same with these three. Versions? Yeah, three stages, yes. Okay. Is that the last stage? No, it's not. Oh. This is still the first stage. Oh, okay. That's all I needed to know for today. Oh. Yes, I wanted to know, and I've written my menu, so I hope you for, forgive me for referring to my notes, um, but uh, uh, I don't usually talk and paint. Um, so <laughs> it, it's, a wonderfully, uh, it's a wonderful solitary activity, and I, I absolutely adore it, and I don't do enough of it. Uh, it's a bit like my fishing, really. So um, uh, I, I suppose this one is probably a little more highly rendered because I, I guess I had more time to think about what the stages and what I was doing was ducking away and yeah. writing notes what I just did so that I could follow that formula today. No, no, no. So, I mean, that's where they end up. They, there, are, there are several stages. Even this one, which is, which is really a, a flat map of colour, had the same... Uh, same three stages, so there was a knock-in stage. Uh, the adjustments about the, d the door actually needed reworking. Um, it uh, it actually needed to be rendered again because it was it was either too far, it was jumping out too much or not sitting back. So uh, the uh, the last thing I did was um, probably that little tuft of grass, you know, which is really a counterpoint. That I mean, it's a device. It's not there because I want grass necessarily, but I was looking for. An, a counterpoint de device with this uh, sheer area of colour. So all of, all of the works, uh, this one included, um, uh, obviously the, the, the rendered background, uh, this, that's not particularly difficult in, in, once the map is there, um, uh, but there's some nuances that are required. Uh, that sweep of the road needed some, some just fine-tuning right at the very end. Um, and, and that may have occurred probably weeks after the, uh, the first colour lay down. So, yeah, three, three stages. There's a, there's a knock-in stage, uh, a forming stage, and then a detail stage. And w one of the problems that uh, students quite often uh, run into is that they'll leap to the detail stage too soon. Uh, and you've got you've to allow those conversations that the colour wants to have and, the, and your composition as well. You've got to allow those to occur... Uh, you know, for whatever time it takes. Um, you can't really force it. Um, uh, painting is a community of process. And, uh, well, the, I mean, it's a, it's, it's a splendid experience if you've ever uh, had uh, uh, a painting that, you haven't, that you've done and completed that somebody else has in their house and then you see it some years later and it, and it still has that, that uh, interesting conversation with it. It's just a, a wonderful experience. I, I hope photographers get that, but I'm guessing they don't, you know.
Um, I guess they have it once, once the shutter's open and closed and then they print it and I, I have no idea. Um, it's all a bit too cerebral for me, but I love that feeling of, of, uh, of having a physical object of bright colours uh, talk to me again and again. Um, uh, well, uh, I think it's a God thing. I, re I mean, I'm not religious. Don't, uh, well, it, you know, um, uh, in, I, well, I don't mean it in a religious sense. I, I think it takes as long as it does because it's a subjective uh, thing. I mean, how long did it take me to uh, understand the nuance of, um, uh, of sadness, you know? Uh, I might have had it as a three-year-old, but I'm guessing not. It wasn't until I'd experienced sadness that, uh, that I got to understand what that really meant. Um, and in the same sense, I can't uh, make a picture and then expect it to happen in a set period of time. Uh, some, some paintings I've worked on for over 10 years because that, that conversation actually takes that long and uh, we really need to have that. Uh, if, uh, have, ha let it have its time Otherwise, uh, it may look forced, and we all know what a forced painting looks like. Um, so that's why I, I think it's a, it's a spiritual thing. You know, it's that relationship, and emotions are a good are a good vehicle for uh, uh, spiritual values, and uh, we need to let the the thing have its conversation within itself, and then with us. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, could you say something about that painting? Was it from a photograph or was it from mm -hmm. your mate's body? One of your photos or someone else's? Uh, both. Uh, I had installed a public mural at Taronga Western's Western Plains Zoo, which is an open range zoo in, in Dubbo in the centre of New South Wales. And uh, you while. Installed a what sculpture? Uh, a public mural. It was oh, a very, yes. very large. So it's a painting? Yes, yes. Uh, and um, while I was there, um, I asked, could I tour the zoo, because they, I was already in it, and can I go and see some things? And uh, so I went and sat with a rhinoceros for a while, and um, uh, the buffalo weren't, weren't coming forward, you know, on that particular day. But this is the Przewalski horse, <coughs> and um, he uh, he's a, had been a, an endangered species, and, and Tronga Western Plains Zoo was part of the um, um, uh, restoration of their uh, endangered status um, uh, out, of, uh, out of endangerment. And uh, you, they've, 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 the, the, uh, the natural environment is the steppes of Mongolia, uh, but they've never been um, uh, successfully uh, interbred or domesticated. So they are a wild horse, and that feature of the, the neck dropping off and the, the, the high brow is peculiar to that animal. They're about the size of a zebra, um, and they're actually a light, dusky brown. They're a beautiful-looking animal. And so I, I drew, the, drew the horse and I photographed the horse and then uh, I, I let my imagination go to town on it. And um, uh, there, there is that colour vortex at work there. I'm not sure if you noticed, but it goes from cool to warm. Yeah. And uh, around a vertical... You see it in the background. Yes. And so if I draw a line there, you would see that on this side, uh, let me s on that side the animal is relatively warm, and on that side he's relatively cool. And that's, that's the colour vortex that I mentioned, which is uh, of particular importance about the best of the foe's work. And that, that vertical dynamic is, is difficult if you do it in a tonal sense because it'll look, look to left and right. But if you do it with colours, it actually works. Uh, most of the tonal gradations in most painting compositions are, are, um, are horizontal. Vertical, a vertical division, um, warm, cool, uh, tonally is, is generally not going to work. It's usually up and down. And uh, so having completed that work... Um, uh, a friend of mine who's an ecologist came around and, and he was quite taken by it and went away to think about buying it and uh, in the meantime I put it on my website uh, and it sold straight away. Yeah, so, yeah. Yeah. Well, and the cool green you've got on the left is obviously that, that's part of your coolness but I wondered about the colours and well it's still the same colour but how come you chose that particular that stripe of colour? 
It, it's it's a device to establish that that uh, that colour vortex. To get it to move. Yes. So without without that, the door is carrying too much weight, and the and the door is a psychological thing, which means uh, it's been released from um, from endangerment. So it's uh, it, and the door is open. I mean, psychologically, uh, what I'm saying is that um, uh, the animal could drift off into um, uh, ex toward extinction again if we're not careful. So I'm making those sorts of statements, but I'm, I'm employing colour as an emotional device to uh, to register that. So that's that's a technical thing, as a counterpoint to to the red there, and its other small counterpoint is a small amount of the same colour there, bouncing there. And of course, it's not pure. Uh, any colour science is not pure. Uh, so there are cool values on that side, and they're all warm values on that side. Um, but I mean, that's yeah, that's part of the the play that we have. That's the same. That's the one that's sold. So don't. <laughs> <laughs> it's gone. The owner, the owner has allowed me to bring it along today. Yeah. So it hasn't even been framed. I mean, that's how fresh it is. It's only been finished a week or so. Yeah. It's very welcome to sell. Ah, yes, that's right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Big pardon? No, he's not. No, he's cheeky, isn't he? Yeah. Okay, uh, I'm I'm not particularly happy with with what's happening there, and they they're too light. But I'll I'll, I'll draw it perhaps in a. So. Is it different to other trees? Is that what you were suggesting? No, not particularly. But uh, gums are are an open foliage tree, so quite often light pours through, and what will happen in uh, in a in a branch, for instance. Um, is it you will get a, a shadow cast from another branch higher up, and and they're a, they're a great device to render the form of the of the tree. You you you'll recognise when you when I've uh, when you when you see this in the bush. So you know there'll be all sorts of shadow casts from other branches higher up because it's an open foliage, and it doesn't happen with elms and and dense European foliage. Things, but it's quite it's quite a unique feature of uh, of eucalypts. Any more questions? Running late? Mm -hmm. No, no, that's all right. <laughs> <laughs> when you complete, is that painting? Will you put that up on the website? Uh, if I complete the painting, I mean, it, it, it's specific for this task. Um, uh, I may. I mean, if it, if I get to it, um, um, I can't think. Yeah, I may. I don't, I don't know, you know. And if it has that conversation, and if the conversation uh, is succinct, then it will. But I ordinarily, as I say, um, don't paint and talk, and I don't ordinarily have uh, a whole bunch of people and uh, all my visitors from the rest of the world in my studio at the same time. Uh, I may just keep an eye on the uh, on the website. <laughs> Um, the, uh, the, the this is the these drawings are part of that uh, research process. I, w I wanted to find a, a, a subject that was suitable that I could talk and paint around at the same time and demonstrate those those notions about colour and the emotional connections with colour uh, that I want you to investigate. I want you to uh, you know find your favourite colour out of your palette and give it an emotional value. The, uh, the emotional spectrum is, is large and uh, you, sh you should be able to do You'll find that really useful thing to do. Yes? Um, why the plant and how long have you been interested in plants? Um, uh, I think I was always taken by the foes, but uh, also by uh, the German equivalent, which was the Blue Writer Group. And um, uh, in my primary school, there was... Um, um, there was a painting of, of horses uh, by, um, yeah, the blue horses. Uh, who was that artist? Do you recall? Franz Mark. Franz Mark, that's right. 
And uh, I was always quite taken with that by the audacious use of colour on a, on a, represent, on, on a representational image. Um, and um, I, I, I just, I guess I'd always wondered about that. But I, uh, as an artist, uh, I suffer from over imaginitis. So it's not, um, it's not unusual for me to see colours where perhaps other people don't and um, to rationalise that. Um, the, the photos do it really well. And, and the other thing, Wendy, too, is that uh, it's, it's such a concise period of paint. And I, I uh, have yet to discover why it was only Matisse that persisted with those high key colours while the others let it go. I mean, there's a lot, lot of things happening in the early part of the 20th century. Um, uh, expressionism, uh, cubism uh, in all its forms. And surrealism was getting off the ground as well. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm a colourist and uh, that, that basic principle, if, you, if I'm going to go to the trouble of taking the top off a, off a colour, it might as well be a bright one. So it's consistent with the, what the, fo the foes seem to do. Yeah. Oh, no, I feel it. I feel it. Um, uh, and no, I don't have names for the array of emotions that I feel. Um, um, you know, I can, I, I can feel stupidly excited from time to time, but I'm pretty sure that's not uh, probably the best description of that colour, you know. Uh, but that's how I feel when I feel <laughs> stupidly excited. Uh, but I, I think it's a good guide. It, it's, it's a really interesting journey to take. Uh, to take an emotional journey with colour uh, as well as that tonal and, uh, and physical property journey as well, yeah. No, um, and, and it, you know, it's an invitation to find your own path with it, yeah, really. Um, I'm sure that when you have your diaphragm here, you'd be putting light colours on top of those groups, don't you? On the right, certainly, yeah. The, the, Uh, not at this point, no. I mean, in in my studio, I'd be walking back and having a cup of tea, and and then um, no, looking for a fair bit first, and yeah. But I, I mean, I had to advance the uh, the, the demonstration, so I, I'll, I'll leave it at that well, for now. Normally, have the light background. Yes, I would normally have the light in the in the succession that I've done it is how I would proceed. Um, but highlights are also part of the detail thing, so I probably wouldn't bother too much about uh, highlights at this stage because I need to form up, I need to stand back, I need to sit with it for a while and make sure that the, the form and it's got its structure is still good, that I haven't departed <laughs> too much from my original design um, and, and just to make sure it's still unique. Uh, quite, I, I haven't looked at it, but um, you, we, uh, we need to make sure that things aren't falling off out of the composition to the right, to the left, to the bottom or the top, that it's succinct. It's going to hold somebody else's attention as long as it's held mine um, by, by being inside of the composition. And um, this work here, for instance, uh, it maintains our attention by design. You know, and I need to adjust certain things. So the highlights are, are really part of the, the detail of, of embellishment, uh, which just gives final detail to a work rather than too early. So, yeah, I mean, that's, that's the guide that I, I often give to students is don't leap to the detail too soon. Let, let that conversation occur and, and uh, do it last, yeah, just before it goes to the framers sometimes, you know. Uh, rarely, rarely, it, because painting for, a, uh, it could happen, I mean your intuition is great when it works, um, but you, it's, you know, uh, it's not much good if it's not working, your intuition won't get you out of that, it's only theory that will get you out of a, prob out of a corner if, uh, if you've started with intuition and, and it's working, that's brilliant, but uh, when it doesn't work that's when you need to call on the theory of, of line, composition, tone, texture. And um, and colour. And you're doing it with what? Just the natural These chalks. Chalks. So it uh, comes away with the paint. Yes. Yes. So it picks up with the paint. Yes. You, you don't sort of see it. The painting has come and then it's put on the paint. No. 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 And uh, yeah. I mean, it, it, if if it's there, if there's a pencil mark there, and it's not it's not a problem, uh, I'll leave it. 
And if it is a problem, I'll deal with it in the detail stage. At that third stage, uh, I'll deal with that either by painting over it or rubbing it out or scratching it off or something. Um, but a, a warm and a cool chalk uh, is what I go with. This had some graphite on it as well. Um, uh, so just a, a regular thin pencil, but lightly, you know. Yeah, so I'm only making a map. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. The sketchbooks are there. There are a number of techniques uh, that I I also demonstrate in my workshop uh, in the sketchbooks. And they might want to book in for a workshop for yes. more details. Yes. Yes, of course. Whether that's a double or you're down in Sydney in March. Yes, September. that's right. Yeah. This one? Yeah. It's called black pepper, not surprisingly. <laughs>